Well, hello, welcome back to another Eye Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Today, we have a longer length lecture for you. We are talking about hospital-based confusion. Now this goes by many different names. The most common and really the most appropriate is delirium, but it is also called acute confusional state, acute mental status change, derangement, ICU psychosis, brain failure, organic brain syndrome, or encephalopathy, which can have a variety of terms before it. Toxic, metabolic, septic, hepaptic. It's a very, very long list of names that essentially come back to this very common clinical syndrome that is characterized by a few different presentations. The first one is a very quick change in mental status or consciousness, change in cognitive function that seemingly happens in a very short amount of time, almost always within a day, if not within a few hours. It has an acute onset and the course is fluctuating. And what I mean by that is the person at times has moments of clarity, but then also becomes extremely confused. We know that this is due to a global change in brain homeostasis, and it is a serious condition that's associated with pretty poor outcomes if intervention is not had. And that is a part of why I'm making this video today, because I often get involved with my patient's care when it comes to delirium. So in the hospital, we dramatically see that the incidence of hospital-based confusion or delirium go up quite a bit. So for all older adults, when they come into the hospital, we see anywhere from a 10 to 20% range. So that would be considered community prevalence. But when we are hospitalized and we are over the age of 65, it goes up to 40%. If you get further into the acute care system when you're in the ICU and you are an older adult, you have a 70 to 87% chance of being diagnosed with hospital-based confusion or delirium. So that is the majority of people. And the concern is that we don't talk about it enough. Hospital providers don't use the term delirium enough. We have to educate the public on what it is and what we can do about it. So I wanna go through the four primary symptoms of delirium. The first one is, like I said, that acute kind of all of a sudden mental status change, and there is reduced awareness of the environment. So it is hard to keep them on topic. One of the things I look for in an interview is the person's eyes darting all around the room, or are they able to stick with me and be engaged for a lengthy conversation? So my interviews are about an hour, but people with delirium often even for two minutes have a hard time just staying engaged with a reciprocal back and forth with me. They are very easily distracted. They can get very stuck on a certain idea and it can just be like a perseveration where they can't let it go. It's like a broken record over and over again. The second one is we see a disturbance in the sleep-wake cycle, the circadian rhythm. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute about the three types of delirium. There's three subtypes and all of them involve changes in sleep. So we typically see it going in either direction. So way too much sleep or not enough sleep or the sleep-wake cycle is disturbed and people get their days and their nights totally mixed up. The third symptom is behavior change. So this is commonly like agitation, um, delusions, feeling like they can't quite remember why they're in the hospital. So the brain fills in a story. I've heard, you know, people feel like they're trapped in a mall overnight. They are a pirate alone on a ship. Uh, oftentimes there is the need to unfortunately physically or chemically restrain people because they're so agitated and they don't understand what's happening. So their brain tells them it's a threat and they want to get out of there. The fourth symptom that we see is very clearly in the realm of psychosis. So I just mentioned delusions a minute ago, which is a false belief, but we very commonly see visual hallucinations. So this can be benign. So I, you know, I just saw my granddaughter, but more commonly they are distressing. So we see bugs, 
a picture. It may not be a full hallucination where the brain creates an image, but it is a misperception or an illusion where the picture on the wall suddenly becomes kind of menacing. So when you see those four symptoms together, we are pretty sure that we are dealing with a delirium and there are three subtypes. So we have hypoactive, hyperactive and mixed and mixed is hands down the most common so in hyperactive these are your combative people your quote uncooperative people they are difficult to care for because they oftentimes require restraint being held down interventions treated with strong medications to keep them quiet but it is better recognized because it's so obvious so therefore these people tend to have a better outcome Hypoactive is what we call the quiet version of delirium. This is the least recognized. And oftentimes these people get labeled as being depressed or having some kind of psychiatric issue. And people with hypoactive delirium often have the worst outcomes because it's just not recognized and we're not calling it what it is. So the treatment is not personalized. But in over 60% of people, they actually have features of both. So when you have both, this again is often mischaracterized, under-recognized, and often misinterpreted as depression or age-related fatigue. Hey, you're 70, you just went through a major surgery. It is a topic that has been very focused on in research and for many years, and the public still runs with this, is that it all comes back to anesthesia. Now that can be a contributing factor, especially when it's general anesthesia, when it is a complicated surgery, when there's some type of reason for the person to be under anesthesia for an extended amount of time, but it's actually not the biggest risk factor. The biggest risk factor is any pre-existing cognitive impairment, and I mean any. The more cognitive impairment you have before going in the hospital, the higher your risk of delirium. So people with dementia are going to be at more advanced age because age is the number one risk factor for all the subtypes of dementia. So we typically associate it with people in their 80s and 90s. But the key thing is really to focus on prevention because we know that any baseline cognitive impairment is the biggest risk factor. The second one after cognitive impairment is abruptly starting or stopping any medication, specifically pain medication. So if you think about what people need after a significant surgery, oftentimes it is pain medication. But also as people are set to be in the hospital for a while or they have a complicated presentation, oftentimes the hospitalist, because their job is acute medical intervention, they sometimes have to take away medications abruptly to get a clearer picture of what's going on. So I commonly see people taken off their antidepressant, taken off their long-time benzodiazepine, suddenly taken off their gabapentin, and this is a second main reason for people having delirium. The third one is infections, and this is so important to know because you need to advocate for a family member. First one is get a urine screen. It's the easiest thing in the world, and it's very common, especially if someone has had any indwelling device. The most common would be a catheter, which happens in all extended surgeries. We also see electrolyte abnormalities, so just a little bit of abnormal sodium or potassium can do tremendously negative things to the brain. We also know that untreated hearing or vision as someone goes into a new setting like a hospital can be very, uh, very much a risk factor for switching them over into having acute confusion. We can also see bowel obstruction, uh, being on bed rest for a prolonged period of time, and sometimes just being in a new setting can be very disruptive. So one of the key things in the hospital that everyone wants to know is, is it delirium or is it dementia, right? Because you would treat those two things a little bit different. And the only way you're gonna figure that out in an acute care setting is going to the expertise of the family, going to someone who knows the person well so they can tell you, is this unusual for the person? What was their baseline level of functioning? 
And secondly, having a conversation with the person where you are looking for the symptoms of inability to stay focused, looking for physical agitation, asking them and and observing their behavior about anxiety. But the key is really to respect the contribution of a loved one, a family member, a neighbor, someone who knows what is normal for the person and simply asking, is this normal? Is this how this person is at their baseline? If they've always been confused, then chances are it's probably some type of dementia that should be worked up as an outpatient. But if it's not, and they're coming to the doctor saying, this is so different, this is not my dad, this is not my friend, this is not my sister, then we have to start using the word delirium and asking the medical team to please work up for infection, to please review medications that have been started or stopped, and to please implement something called the HELP protocol. Now, HELP is ideally a prevention protocol, and you can look that up. It's a very well-known volunteer-based hospital program that identifies people who are at risk for delirium, and gives them very specific interventions, but you can also do it once delirium has started. So I'm gonna go back to that in a few minutes. So oftentimes the big question that I have in my practice is what is the prognosis? What is gonna happen to my person in the future? Well, it's variable. I cannot tell you there's not one outcome for delirium. Full recovery while you're in the hospital is not likely. 30% of people with delirium still have their symptoms six months later. So it can do a few things. It can totally resolve once the offending agent has been taken away. So if there is a urine infection, bladder infection, kidney infection, toenail infection, and you get the right treatment, then the delirium should reduce over time. Other times people just snap out of it. I've heard people talk about like a curtain rising as they were in their house for a few days and they're totally back to normal. I've unfortunately also seen people go on and on and on with confusion indefinitely. And very often they have been discharged on medications like pain medications, benzos, something like that that goes on and on. So if that's the case and it's been some time, usually a urine screen and a medication review will be revealing and hopefully get to some type of help. So what is the impact of delirium on the person? Well, it's actually very traumatic to be inside of a delirium. People often tell me and other scientists, researchers, that they have fragments of memory and that's very traumatizing. They can't put together the whole story. They remember wanting to connect, almost like a locked-in syndrome, but they were very, very, very fearful. The agitation that we see on the outside, I think, is nothing compared to what the person feels like on the inside. And as they're resolving the delirium, oftentimes there's this feeling like, I have to get the story straight, a real push to understand what had happened. They are also oftentimes bothered or traumatized by stories that we tell them about what they did when they were delirious, which can lead to feelings of being out of control, uh, not being in charge of ourselves, which is pretty scary. We also know that there's huge effects on the family, right? It really is stressful to love someone who's going through this. Spouses and primary caregivers are particularly stressed. We get most stressed out as family members with the agitation because the person is so clearly bothered, typically by a delusion that we just cannot seem to get into their head. We oftentimes worry, as we should if we love someone, what is their experience? But the real barrier I see is the lack of education from hospital staff to the patient's family. I think by just saying the word delirium, people can go home and Google it, they can find videos like this, they can be their own detectives, they can start to become a better advocate, but when they don't know what it is and everyone just kind of says, well, maybe it's dementia or maybe it's age, it just gets very, very overwhelming. And that really is why I'm here is to try to provide science-based objective brain health information. If someone is out there searching, they can hopefully land on this channel and get high quality information that will change the course of their health. There is also the effect on healthcare providers. Wellness of medical providers is something I am newly interested in, more committed to. And we know that it's very tough on staff, very tough on nurses, especially the overnight shift when some of those sleep-wake behaviors become the most significant. 
We know that younger nurses find it harder to take care of these people. So we need to do more to support them with strategies and behavioral interventions without just relying on those restraints I mentioned earlier. There's also a huge effect on hospital systems. It is uh, right next to diabetes and falls with the major cost of major cause of increasing cost. Uh, complicates about 2.3 million hospitalizations annually and is responsible for up to 50% of all hospital days. So that is $8 billion to a typical hospital system. That is dramatic, okay? So one of the main issues is that it continues to go unrecognized. So anywhere up to 70% of people with delirium don't have it mentioned in the hospital record. 33 to 95% of people with actual delirium get misdiagnosed as having depression, dementia, or psychosis. And as I said before, the risk factors for it not being recognized are when it's hypoactive and there's a lot of sleeping or negative symptoms, when the person is of advanced age, because like so many things, it just kind of gets written off. So let's talk about evidence-based management of dementia. So the first thing is prevention, early identification of who's likely to get it, implementing what we call the HELP program, which I'll tell you about in a minute, rapid medical assessment and treatment of any underlying etiology that's maybe causing the delirium, like the sodium, the potassium, the UTI, and then multi-component management of symptoms. So the first thing is any person over 65 should be screened for risk factors for delirium. If they or a family member says they have any degree of cognitive impairment, they should be immediately told you must have your glasses. I know this is kind of a little hmm, interesting. You must have your hearing aids and glasses. So untreated sensory deficits are a huge exacerbator of cognitive impairment when you're in the hospital. The next thing is that the staff and family should be working together as an empowered team to start monitoring for those fluctuations. That is key. So if someone's mental status just is all over the map, if the sleep is awake and then agitated and deep sleep and up and down and just that kind of uh, fluctuation, that is one of the biggest things that we worry about. There is something called the confusion assessment method. And what I really appreciate it about it is how simple and quick it is. The ultra brief two item bedside test for delirium has a 93% sensitivity rate and it is made up of two questions. What day of the week is it? And can you tell me the months of the year backwards? If people can't do that, there is a 93% chance that they actually have delirium. We also have the single question test in delirium, which is asking a family member, do you feel that your loved one has been more confused lately since they've been in the hospital? This one has a sensitivity rating of about 80%. So this is a, a protocol that is minuscule in terms of staff investment, but can then offer us a window into personalized treatment. So I wanna go and tell you a little bit about the HELP program before I let you go. Hospital Elder Life Program, so look that up. It started at Yale New Haven Hospital, and it provides an organized system of volunteers who actually do what everybody knows should be done, but never seems to get done when there's much more acute medical things to attend to. So it has been shown in multiple studies to effectively prevent delirium, to improve delirium, to improve uh, cognitive decline after delirium, to prevent cognitive decline, decrease hospital length of stay, reduce nursing home placements, decrease sitter use, and reduce hospital falls. So it is made up of a variety of interventions. One is the daily visitor program, the early mobilization program, getting people up and walking, non-pharmacological sleep interventions. There is a cup of warm milk that comes in this protocol. Hearing and vision, you have to have clean glasses, you have to have your hearing aids in. Feeding assistance to make sure someone's actually taking in liquids and high protein food. There is an education component. There are links with community services and there is geriatric interdisciplinary care. When hospital systems do this, they save a ton of money, their patients come out better, caregiver stress is lower. It is just a win-win across the board. It definitely improves long-term outcomes. So please 
Let me know if this lecture was helpful to you. I would appreciate hearing any of your personal stories in the comments. And remember, we are all learning from each other. So anything you can contribute about what you've learned with this very stressful neurological condition will benefit other people. Okay, thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.